Hi everybody, it's Laura from Omtara. I'm so glad to see you today. Uh, today we're starting our beading class, our Thursday beading class. I'm calling it Beading 101. And today I'm going to just start at the beginning, where I, whenever I taught at our college class over the 10 years I taught, every, every semester that I started, I always started at the beginning because I like to really get everybody on board uh, in the same place. So uh, I'm going to start talking today about what you need to bead and the very um, most basic are what are the tools. So I'm going to talk about tools, I'm going to talk about supplies and give you some tips, kind of what I do. And I also want to say to people who are experienced beaders, um, hopefully that there's something here for you too in this very first class. Uh, and I'm going to just uh, share with you some of my some of the way that I see things. And I'll also give you some tips about um, for those of you who are just starting. I see comments about this a lot. How do I start? What do I do? Sometimes starting is the hardest part. So today, after we do, we talk about the stuff. I'm just going to show. Uh, a very simple, uh, whimsical uh, project, uh, Sun Catcher. It is completely random, and so if you ever get stuck, start random. I know random can be hard, but this project hopefully will be a great jumping off space to get your creativity uh, moving. So we're gonna start. I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna just talk about the tools that I use and that I recommend, if, especially if you're just starting to bead. Um, and I'll talk about them, hold them up, and tell you what they do. And then I'm going to demo with the crimper and the cutter uh, when we start doing our project. So I'm going to start. So the very first tool that I recommend for beading, we're talking about bead stringing right now. For the first couple weeks, we're going to do bead stringing. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different projects that you can use with stringing. If you are new to beading and you don't even know what I'm talking about, don't worry, I'll, I'll get you up to speed. So uh, the very first tool I recommend you having for um, for bead stringing is a crimper. And a crimper, for those of you that don't know, it secures your beads on the on a wire. There, uh, I'll talk about the crimps in just a bit, but this tool is what makes sure your beads are not going to fall off. So after, after you've done all that work of designing and stringing them on a piece of wire, how do you, how do you secure them so they don't fall off? So this is the tool to do it. Uh, so this is a crimper. This is a, the, a crimper that I invented. It's called the Omtara crimper. And if you have seen uh, the traditional crimper, I call it, in craft stores or any of the beading stores, mine looks similar, but it's a little bit different. So um, there's a little tooth at the top and a little dip on the bottom. Mine has a little flat nose plier at the end, so I'm going to just turn it like that so you can see that it's a little plier. I use it for opening jump rings, and uh, I just kind of use it as an extra plier. But this is a um, what I call the Omtar crimper. It's my crimper. I invented it, and I'm going to show you how it works. So you definitely need a crimper uh, if you're doing bead stringing. And those of you who have a traditional crimper or are working with one, um, the difference, I'll show you when I'm demoing, but the difference is that once you squeeze it, that tooth comes down and connects with the crimp and the wire, it's crimped. You don't have to fold it to secure it. You can if you want, you like the look, but once you squeeze it, it's crimped. So, uh, so you need a crimper, and uh, I'll talk more about that in just a bit. I'm going to lay it out on my beading table. The next tool that I recommend is a chain nose plier, and I like to, I'll bring it up here, see if I can get my face out of the way. So uh, this is a chain nose plier, I'm going to turn it this way, it's tapered, you can see, it comes down to a taper, almost to a point, depending on the ones that you buy, they can be more snub nosed or they can be more fine. If I turn it this way, it comes down to a taper too. And when I turn it this way, you can see that the jaw inside is, is flat, I'm going to turn it that way too. Sometimes you can find chain nose pliers that are serrated. They'll have little sharp teeth in there. Uh, you'll find them smooth. This one is relatively smooth. Sometimes you'll also find them where they're scored inside. Um, I prefer one that this has a little bit of a grip. Uh, it's hard to see. These are my tools uh, that I developed to go with my crimping. I made a tool set. set. Um, this one has a very, like a little bit of roughness so you can grip, but it's not rough enough like teeth. Um, so that it mars your wire when you're working with hard wire. So I use chain nose pliers in stringing with opening jump rings and things like that. I also, they're essential for when you're doing wire work. So when we get into uh, talking about wire work, creating wire jewelry, uh, chain nose pliers are essential. They're really an essential tool. I'm going to skip ahead to a tool that I, um, I wouldn't say it's an essential tool, but it's one of my favorites. So I'm going to hold it up there. So this is our chain nose I just spoke about, and this is what I call, this is called a bent nose, and you can see 
they are essentially the same tool except that the bent nose has an angle. It's bent. Um, and what I used to say to my students in, at the college is that if you have a chain nose, you don't really need a bent nose. If you have a bent nose, you don't really need a chain nose. Um, if you have both, I know you'll use them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the bent nose right now. Uh, one of the things that I like about the bent nose is even you just see that little space right in here. Uh, it gives you just a little bit extra space when you're wire working and you're wire wrapping. And the other thing I like to do, I turn it around here, and when I'm opening really heavy jump rings, uh, sturdy, uh, stiff jump rings, using what I call the elbow here, uh, gives it just enough torque. It just has a nice little grip. So I like to use the back side of my bent nose, and I call that the elbow. I do sell these to a lot of chainmail um, artists. Uh, so I love my bent nose. So if you if you have one, you'll like you'll love it. I'm sure. Uh, then the next uh, tool that I would recommend to we're going to use this one. This is again an essential wire wrapping tool. We're not going to use it today. We don't really. We're not going to be doing that kind of um, beading. But this is a round nose plier. So this one again, it's tapered when I turn it this way. It comes down to a kind of a small small tip. When I turn it this way, it comes down to a small tip. And the difference is that this is shaped like an ice cream cone or conical shape. So um, this is a round nose plier, and when I use my round nose pliers, I'm making round loops. So uh, for the top of an earring, for creating wire wrapped links or your own chain, you need to have a tool that creates a nice round shape. So these are called round nose pliers, and you can find them again where they're more snub at the tip. You can find them where they're more pointy. Uh, you can also find them where the top end is quite wide, or you can find them where the top end is a little bit more fine. So really there's a lot of choices out there, um, and you have to just find the one that works for you or the one that you like. So these are a round nose plier. And I would say my fourth uh, tool is a cutter. And you want to find a really sharp cutter. Uh, I know uh, often when I, when I know people are starting, they'll go out to their local craft store and maybe buy a kit with um, the, four ba the three basic tools, usually a round nose, a chain nose, a cutter, maybe a flat nose. Um, sometimes there'll even be a crimper in that kit. Uh, oftentimes in those uh, beginner uh, beading kits, the cutters are not that sharp. And that's one of the places that you do really wanna, um, if you're gonna invest some money in a, in a tool, make sure you're getting a good cutter because it can be the most frustrating tool. Uh, um, this is a, a, a German cutter. It is a pointed tip and it's got a nice little nipper where you can get close in. When I turn it on the back, it is a flush. So it's kind of flat on the back. So when I'm nipping my wire, it's gonna create a nice flush cut. Uh, and we'll talk more about the cuts when we get into doing wire work. Uh, one reason I love this, this cutter um, the reason I put it in my toolkits, and I also have another one that I, that's an Italian cutter that is shaped a little bit different and the grips are a little bit different, but they function the same in that they're hardened for steel. And so when we start talking about um, uh, stringing wire, which I'll get to, uh, people don't often realize that stringing wire is steel cable. So it's uh, little spun filaments of steel. And so over time, if you're using just a regular cutter, and you're cutting your stringing wire, some of you may have noticed that your little cutter gets these little divots or what I call little chomp marks in the blade. And then you kind of have to hunt for where the sharp edge is still there. And the reason that happens is that steel is very strong. And if you don't have a cutter that's hardened to cut steel, then over time, the steel is actually gonna cut your cutter. So you're gonna get those little chomp marks in the blades. So when I chose cutters for my toolkits, I chose them uh, that were hardened um, for steel. So these, this cutter, the German cutter, and also the Italian cutter that I have um, are hardened for steel. So they'll last much longer, they'll retain their sharpness longer, and they will not put the divots in as you're chomping the, your stringing wire over time. So that's a cutter. So I'll just go back again. I'm gonna say that the four tools that you really need for beading, are, one is a crimper. It's gonna float in from out here. Crimping plier, chain nose plier. When I used to teach uh, kids, I called it the alligator nose because it looks quite like a little snout. And round nose plier. Again, got that little tapered look, but it has ice cream cones on the tips. Nice conical shaped. And then 
cutter. And those are your four go-to tools for beading. You could start there and, and get by very well with those four cutters, with those four tools. Some of the other ones that I like, um, I love these tools. I'm going to pull them out here out of my toolkit. Um, are these, I call them the best scissors ever. I love these. Uh, these are just kind of an add-on tool if you want, but I love them. I use them in all my, um, in all my classes for cutting material. They'll actually cut stringing wire. They'll cut Kevlar thread, fire line, fishing line, pretty much anything you want to cut. They'll cut up to 16 gauge craft wire. Uh, so I use these um, if I want to save my good cutters. I use these for cutting my materials. So a nice little pair of uh, serrated scissors. And then another tool that you might need is just a tweezer. When we get into knotting, um, I'm going to show you different ways of knotting cord, uh, but tweezers are always really a great tool to have. I love these. These, are a, these particular ones are super good at unknotting. <laughs> so when I teach knotting in person, I end up helping people unknot a lot of the knots that didn't land where they wanted to. And these, oh my gosh, I, I don't know what I would do without these tweezers. I love them. They're excellent. So I'm going to plunk that back in there. Um, so let's go. I'm going to turn the, the camera around and get you all set up. For those of you, um, if you don't follow me on Instagram, every every week I pick a card, and uh, this week's I call it the word of the week, and today's card uh, word uh, this week's word is whimsy. So um, I keep that word in my mind uh, throughout the week, and so today's project that we're going to do the Suncatcher project, I think of it as it has a bit of whimsy in it, and so um, so I thought it was perfect for our day today. I'm going to put that back there. And that'll let just sit with us. So the very first thing I'm going to talk about is stringing wire because that is what gets, I'm going to just put out some here and let me take this one out too. So uh, stringing wire is cable, that steel cable that I was talking about. Here it is. This is a very fine flexible steel cable and this is what we put um, the beads on. So I'm going to uh, just talk about it because when you go into one, there's another um, company called Beadalon that I could not find their spool, so I've got a couple different ones. When you go into the bead store or to the craft store, you'll often find a lot of different choices or if you're buying online, there's so many different choices and there's uh, specific information that you need to watch for when you're buying. I've had people ask me, why is this stringing wire six dollars and this one's twenty nine dollars if you don't know what to look for it's very confusing uh, about what to what to look for so I'm going to talk about that so I'm going to start with this one and I want you to see this little decimal here it says 0.010 and that is talking about uh, how thick or thin the wire is so you want to look for a decimal like that one this one says 0 0.010 and if I pull the wire out I'll show you it's super super fine oh there it is it's really fine this is like almost hair hair fine so the smaller the decimal here uh, the more fine it is you're also going to find a number that tells you how many feet are in the spool and the other one you're going to find a strand so I'm going to talk about those different numbers so there's our first number that we're looking at. How thick or um, heavy is this wire? So this, this one is pretty fine, 0 0.010. As far as I know, that's the finest wire that you can get, the thinnest. Now this is by Softflex, and you can see their, their decimal is in a different spot on the label. And there's this 0 0.019. 0.019, let's see if this one is pulled out. Let's see, I think, oh, here's one. This is the same, 0 0.019. You can see it's got a little bit of body it's kind of thicker uh, definitely thicker than this very hair thin uh, wire here so that decimal it matters if you have some very small pearls I mean pearls that have small holes then you want to make sure that you're getting the wire that's going to fit through the holes of those beads 0.019 is on the medium working into heavy I would say getting heavier um, and 0 0.010 is very fine I like to work with 0 0.012, 0 0.015, 0 0.018 or 9. And the other thing too is that different companies have different different numbers. So one company, Beadalon, might say 0 0.018, Softflex says 0 0.019. So these are things that as you start looking around you'll notice. But that decimal there is talking about the weight or the thickness of your wire. 
And here's another one. This one is Accuflex, and you can see the decimals way down there, really, really tiny. So this is where you want to be looking for um, the information. So that's your thickness. Sometimes on the label they'll say uh, fine. Sometimes they'll say medium weight. Sometimes they'll say extra fine. Sometimes they'll say thick. So every company has different information on their label that you want to look for. This one again, now we we'll go to the feet. This one says this, this spool has a hundred feet of, of wire on, on this spool. This one has 30 feet like the other one did. The other thing that you want to look for is the number of strands. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. This, as I said before when we were talking about um, the cutter, this cable, I'm going to use that thicker one. Let's see if you can see. It's hard to see. Um, but this has a colored plastic coating, vinyl coating over it. But inside that cord, there are a certain number of strands of steel that are spun. This one has, let's see what it says, see if I can see how many strands are on there. Oh, this one, if I swoop around, says there are seven strands times seven wires. So I believe that means there's 49 strands. 49 wires of strength. So they're saying that this has 49 little filaments of wire inside that tiny space. And then this colored vinyl sheath goes over all those spun wires. And um, you can buy either silver wire, you can buy wires in all different colors. There's another really pretty color. And then you can also buy it in gold. So um, things to look for. But those strand means this one has 19 strands. So in this tiny little filament of wire, there are 19 strands of steel spun into a cable. So that's what that means. And what you'll find, this one has 49 strands. It's very obvious. There it is. So what they're saying is this um, Acuflex is giving you some more information. 49 strands they can show you right here. There's the, um, the little spool, the little um, filaments of steel, those little dots that are all spun together. And then all those filaments are spun together into one, one cord. And so 49 strands are saying, and what... Um, it's generally thought of that the more strands, the more the tinier those strands are, uh, and the the more they drape. So the more strands, the more drape. The more strands, the stronger. That's generally what's um, what's what's it, it's considered. So also when you're out there shopping for it, the more strands there are, the, the more expensive it's going to be. Now I've been talking about this cable being steel. But you can also buy sterling silver um, stringing wire. And again, so you want to be looking for that. Uh, if you end up picking up a spool that is nice and shiny and bright, and it happens to be more expensive than the other ones, you might want to be looking on the label to make sure uh, that it's, you know, what it's made of. Yeah, the sterling wire is definitely going to be more expensive than the steel wire. So I hope that is helpful information. I know that I've been asked this question over and over and over again about what's the difference between stringing wire and there, um, you know, there's, you can see just, there's a lot of, a lot of different um, information on the labels to look for. So hopefully that's helpful to you. So for beading, we need flexible stringing wire. Oh, and I wanna show you too, these are commercial spools. And this, huh, this is what I get. So I get, these are thousand foot spools, or more maybe, but yeah, and this is 0.015. This is a steel, you can see it's the steel color. It's sheathed in a, a clear um, vinyl sheath, and um, this one is a seven strand um, spool. So that's stringing wire. First thing I wanted to talk to you about um, are crimps. So I'm going to bring some out here. I've got my little my little dishes that I use for my scale, my weight scale. And here's my other ones that I'm gonna use for a project. So crimps are a, um, are a little tube of metal. The ones in the black uh, dishes are sterling. So I'm gonna bring them up here so you can see. These are two millimeter uh, in diameter and two millimeter long. So these are called two by two crimps and they're shaped like a little cylinder or a tube. So these are two millimeter tube crimps, and these are sterling silver. 
You can buy crimps in all sorts of metals, um, base metals, and uh, silver and gold, and copper, and some other ones. These are silver plated crimps. These are also two millimeter crimps. It's hard to see it, probably against the white. The whole size is two millimeters, and they're shaped like a ball, so they're a little bit rounded, a little bit curved, where um, these were much more cylindrical. They're very straight. Typically, the traditional crimper uh, will not crimp a ball crimp or a round crimp. Uh, the traditional crimper uh, likes only the tube crimps, so and they like this size 2x2. Two two. Um, my own Tara crimper will crimp any size crimper, any size crimp, uh, any, any type of crimp. So um, I'm going to bring these up. These are invisible, almost. These are tiny. These are one by ones. So these are, oh, these are one by one and a halfs, I think. So they're talking about millimeters, and these are very, very tiny crimps, very um, uh, little micro crimps, they're called. And they're great for if you're making an illusion necklace, which is a, a floating bead necklace. These uh, crimps are perfect for stopping the bead in place where you want it. And they're so small, they, they're really hard to see once they're on your piece. Uh, these crimps too, I'm gonna bring these up. These are a three millimeter crimp. So they have a three millimeter uh, diameter hole. And you can use these for thin leather, cord, um, thicker wires. I use these for, um, for cord and for thinner leather. So those are uh, crimps. And so I'm gonna show you uh, how to use them. They, their function, what they do, is they secure this wire. So once I start putting beads on this wire, it's going to fall off. If I want to add a clasp or I want to join the, the two ends of my piece together, I need to use a crimp to do that. Uh, typically when you buy a crimper, if you buy the traditional crimper at a um, craft show or craft store, you need to buy a crimper for the two millimeter size, you need to buy a crimper for the one millimeter size, and you need to buy a crimper for the three millimeter size. So usually if you want to use multiple sizes of crimps, you need to buy three different crimpers. And this is a little um, a little uh, ad for my crimper. Um, my The Om Tara crimper, you can use this one crimper to crimp all sizes. So uh, it is a good, it, that's one of the benefits of using that crimper. I'm gonna take these away. So crimps, those we need, essential. And then the next thing I'm gonna just show you, we're not gonna, well, we are gonna use one of them today. These are jump rings. Um, Oh, I was going to do clasps, but I'll do jump rings first now that I have it out here. So I'm going to just bring it up. You can see these are all open jump rings. Um, that means that they're little uh, uh, circles of metal, and they're not soldered closed. They're open. This one's a little oval. I love using the ovals. These are some gold twisteds, which are really nice and decorative. You can see that little slot right there. That's where I can open it and attach it. To something. Um, this crimp, this jump ring is soldered closed. This is a nice heavy um, jump ring and I'm going to use that today for our um, sun catcher project. Uh, these are used for joining things together, for perhaps joining your clasp uh, to, your to your necklace, um, adding for charm necklaces or charm bracelets. Jump rings are really essential. Um, components or findings that you'll use. And they come in so many different metals, so many different shapes, sizes, weights. You can see the difference between this round and this oval. Uh, this is a much heavier wire than this one. And again, this is, a, again, even heavier. So they come in all different weights and thicknesses, shapes, metals, and sizes. So um, those are jump rings. And we'll use those. Uh, we won't use them to, oh, we we'll, won't use the smaller ones today, but we will use the large, the large twisted one today. Jump rings are used for connecting uh, pieces together, one thing to another. And I'm going to just show you, oh darn it, I forgot to grab a lo lobster claw. That was one of the things that I wanted to get, but hopefully most of you are used to lobster claws. So these are different clasps. So these are, this is a big wide one, let's see what I've got, something like that. Y these are all single strand clasps, so they have this loop here that I'm going to join uh, my piece to if I were making a necklace. Um, you can also buy multiple strand clasps that have multiple loops at the end so you can so you can crimp on multiple strands. This is a toggle. Um, I love toggle strand toggle clasps. 
where this little T-bar pops through the ring and then sits and rests like that. I love that. My fingers are in the way, but I love toggle clasps. Uh, this is kind of a decorative hook and eye clasp. There's all different types of hook and eye clasps out there. These are some of my favorites. I love these. Um, so hook and eye clasp, toggle clasps. I'm not even sure what this is, but uh, what it would be called, but I guess it's a kind of a big wide hook clasp, different type of hook clasp. And then there's the more traditional spring clasp that you probably have um, seen. There are little rounds with, you pull on it and a lever and it opens up so you can get it on. And then a lobster clasp. So clasps are essential. It's the way we, um, what we attach our beading to. It's how we take our pieces on and off. And you can see, um, this is my leather stuff and I talked about this before, but I also use buttons for um, my clasps. And even when you're doing stringing, string wire and crimping, you can also use buttons as your, as your clasp. You, so that's another way to um, take your work on and off. So clasp, so we went over stringing wire. We went over crimps and we went over clasps and we went over some jump rings these are some these are what i call all of this these are called findings and so if you're on a website and it says findings that's what they're talking about they're all the things that go into making a piece of jewelry that is not the bead essentially so um so we've got some findings there first of all before we start i have some basic beading kind of guidelines that I like to support people to do. One of, uh, one of them is, yes, you are allowed to take your piece apart. So if you make something and you're not sure you like it, yes, you are allowed to take it apart. And number two, yes, you are allowed to change your mind midstream. So if you're working on something and you really aren't sure you like where it's going, you're, you're allowed to change your mind. And three, yes, you are allowed to take time to get it the way that you want, just the way you want. So you're allowed to take the time you need to make a piece um, the way you want. So that, just so you know, that's how I look at beading. And then the other thing, I have a personal beading rule, which is the, that I finish what I start. I have gotten into making a piece that I just think is horrible and I don't want to do it anymore and what usually happens when that happens let me turn you around real quick uh, usually what happens if you're in the middle of a project and you don't like it and you want to stop and you hate it um, if you put that down it will stay in a ziplock or in a bead bag or on a plate or wherever you left it probably for a long time <laughs> you may you may never get back to it so I have a personal rule that when I'm working on something, I finish it. And I like to think of beading uh, the way I think of cooking, that cooking can be a messy process. When you're creating something or you're baking, it does not look like the finished product until the end. So I like to think of beading that way too. So I give myself permission to finish what I start, keep going, and at the end I decide, hmm, do I like it? Do I wanna take it apart? Maybe I want to gift it to someone. Maybe they like it. Um, so I like to follow it through because you really don't know what it's going to look like until it's done. So I'm just just my little my little two cents. And we're going to be working on strong projects for probably the next couple of weeks. I just uh, just have some fun ideas that I want to show you. I'll say a little bit about stringing. Stringing is the most basic and most essential. Uh, techniques. Pretty much uh, you, it's one of the first things you learn when you start beading and so it's a it's considered a beginning technique but if you're beading in 20 years and you're putting beads on a wire you're stringing. So it's a foundational technique and it's one that translates from beginner all the way to experienced beater. So if you go into a very fine uh, high-end jewelry store and there are beads strung and they're on a clasp they're they're strong so so uh, it, it kind of reaches both ends of the spectrum so um, I like to give people a lot of different uh, options for stringing it's not just putting beads on a wire keeping it straight putting a clasp on and you're done so uh, we're gonna explore 
some different ways of using stringing wire and crimps and uh, so we'll do that for the next couple weeks and then we'll see where it goes so okay so let, I'm going to turn the camera around we're going to jump into making our um, our sun catcher and I'm going to do a crimping demo while we do that and show you different ways of using well, di using different beads uh, for your sun catcher the bottom of your sun catcher I'm going to switch you around So we're going to start, I've got a bunch of different beading wires here um, I, because I wanted to show you a couple different ways of, uh, of creating the, the base. Our sun catcher is going to start with something weighted on the bottom. So I have this um, little quartz, uh, little pyramid piece. I also could use, this is just a gem, a gemstone uh, drop, a cut gemstone drop. This is a jasper drop. I have just a big uh, fluorite bead that has a hole that goes all the way through. And then some of you, if you like to go to thrift stores or to, um, you know, yard sales and stuff, these, this is just an old chandelier uh, piece. I have, I collect these, I love them. So these are really nice to use for the basic sun catchers. And since our word is whimsy, I brought some other things that you can, uh, that you could use so these are from, I know a lot of us have junk jewelry or broken jewelry, or you can go to the thrift store and buy broken jewelry very inexpensively. So here's just a shell base, kind of like a donut. And I know oftentimes when people go to the gem fairs, they, they buy donut shaped beads and then they don't really know how to use them. So this is another base that you could use. This is a really pretty little uh, coconut flower that I gathered up from somewhere thought that would be a nice base. Here's another donut shaped bead that, that you could use as a base. Also um, another thing from Broken Jewelry, if you have any of the metal, um, metal beads, this would be a nice base too. So you can use metal beads as the base too, metal components. And this I think is a polymer clay piece that I got uh, probably in a junk, junk box. So this is something that could be used as the bottom too. So anything really that you um, want to use or have on hand could be your base for your sun catcher. You want it to have a, more weight than the beads that you're stringing on the, on the, on the wire because it's going to be the weight that holds it down. So we'll start. I'm going to take these out. I think I'm going to work with, uh, I'm going to show you how to use this one, how to use this one, and I think I'll show you how to use this one. Uh, I think I'll show you this one. I'm going to show you three different ways. So we'll start. I am going to use some of these little base metal crimps. And base metal, these are brass crimps that are plated silver. And I'm going to unwrap my piece of wire. This is a three foot piece of wire, which I probably don't need all of it. I'm going to just do a demo, so I probably won't make a really long one. Let me do that out of camera. So I'm going to start with uh, just this little, uh, this crystal. And I have my wire, very thin, and I'm going to first put a crimp on. So what I'm doing is threading the crimp on. I only need one crimp, and I'm going to thread this right through the loop on my sun catcher. Now what I would be doing, I'm going to pop that back down, if I were making a necklace, I would thread it right through the loop on my clasp. So same technique. So I'm going to use the same technique of, of adding on, casting on or adding on my wire to something, same way I would add on a clasp, just like that. But instead of using a clasp today, I'm going to use my, my crystal. So I have one, one crown. This is 0.015 wire, and for something like uh, this crystal, I might go a little heavier, but for just the demo, I'm going to use uh, use what I have. And generally, uh, with the stringing wire, your bead will tell you the weight that you're going to use because uh, you can have a very heavy bead and a very tiny hole, and if you you know that you're only going to be able to use the wire that will fit through the hole. So. Um, Generally, I would say for a heavy bead, I would use a heavier wire, and a lighter bead, I would use a lighter wire. But again, the whole of the bead is going to tell you what, what wire you can use. So here we go. So I've got my crimp on the wire. 
I've got my wire threaded through the loop of my focal piece and I'm going to jump up and over and I'm going to thread that wire right back through the crimp. I'm going to let you see that. So see how I've got that threaded through there? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this, let me flip it around, I'm going to make this loop aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> and that's really up to you. What you want to do is you want to make sure that your loop is small enough that this piece, whether it's your clasp or your dangle or whatever you're dangling from, can move easily because over time if I shrink that wire loop too small, over time this will move and it will basically chew the wire right through there where the crimp, crimp and the um, wire meet. So you want to give this enough space to to move but not be so big and floppy that it, you don't like how it looks so that's really a personal up to you know up to you um, your aesthetics and I'm just going to show you a little trick I'm going to take my my crimper you can see my tooth I'm going to try to tip that sorry without the shine um, that tooth comes down into that dip I'm going to place my crimp in the dip I'm going to see if I can show you this that bead is kind of heavy See how the crimp is sitting in there? And then my tooth is just sitting there holding onto the crimp. And then I'm just gonna slide it up into place. As long as I haven't squeezed it too much, I can use this tool you know, as my fingers because my fingers were a little bit um, getting in the way. So I'm just gonna slide it up. I'm gonna check the size of my loop. And then once I like it, I'm just gonna squeeze. And that's it. I'm gonna do a tug test and just check and that's crimped. So once you cr use the, uh, my crimper, I'm going to tip it this way so you can see, um, it is secure. I could tug on it. It's not going to go anywhere. Now you may want to, um, people who are used to the traditional crimper, uh, they might, you, you may want to have that, they're used to the folded looking crimp. So um, if you want to fold it, you can. If you want to flatten it, you can. And usually what I do is I use the, the tip, this flat tip here to do any folding or flattening. So I'm just gonna come, see if I can get that to show you. Whoops, I'm gonna look at it and not look in the camera. I'm gonna look at it while I do this. Yeah, you can see how it's sitting across perpendicular. And as long as I get that in there, sorry, I'm making it look a lot harder. I'm just gonna fold it in half. And all that does is really make my crimp smaller, gives it a little smaller profile and then I don't have to, I don't have, it just kind of goes invisible, which is good. So that's one ending, and I'm going to leave that one here. I'm going to show you how to use uh, just a bead that has a drilled through hole as, as your base. So let me unwind another piece. And for this, because my crimp is so small, uh, I'm going to create a little, uh, I need to have something that's going to stop my wire from and my crimp from falling out the bottom of that hole. That hole's pretty big. Uh, it's much bigger than my crimp. So I'm going to show you how to create a little um, kind of little three bead uh, base. So I'm using uh, size number eight seed beads. And with crimping, I use any kind of bead. I use. Um, let me put my crimp on first again. Put my crimp on first. Let me get these out of the way so you can actually see what I'm doing. I'm going to close my door so. My dog can bark out there. People are starting to come home from work in my neighborhood. So here we go. I've got my crimp on my wire. I'm going to put three beads on. These are number eight seed beads. I could use smaller ones if I wanted to, but I'm going to use these. And then that same technique, I'm going to jump back over, around, go back through the crimp and get my fingers out. And I'm creating this loop again. And I'm going to create a little decorative uh, design at the bottom of this wire. So I'm just going to, again, use my crimper. The crimp's in the dip. My tooth is holding on to the top of the crimp, but I'm not squeezing it. And I'm just going to slide the crimp down until I get this nice little triangle shape. And if I want to, I could fiddle around and help pull, but I'm just going to do that, squeeze. And now I have this little triangle shape bead at the bottom. I'm going to come up again from the bottom and you can't really see that this way. 
and then just fold my crimp in half. So now my crimp is crimped, my beads are there, I can tug on it, nothing's going to come off, and now I can slide my heavy bead on. I'm going to tuck that little tail up through there too, just to give it some extra weight. And if I'm lucky, aha, uh -huh, that's just what I was hoping. Um, that crimp just jumped right into the hole of the bead. And so now it's you can't see it. So that's how, and then I would take my cutter and nip off that extra, that extra wire, and I'll do that with my, there. So that's another way that you can use a heavy bead or a gemstone bead. Um, I could have done that with just a single bead, but doing the three gives it just a little decorative motif like that. So that's, an, again, the base that could be a base of my piece. I'm going to leave that one over there. And I'll show you one more with a donut shape bead. And now for this one, I'm going to again put my crimp on first. Oops. Slide that up. And then I'm going to put on a whole bunch of uh, seed beads. And I'm not sure how many I need. I'm going to say I probably need about 10. And I'm going to explain why in just a minute. So I'm just going to start putting some beads on. I've got seven on there, I think. And you can see I'm using my stringing wire like a little needle. Okay, let's try that. What I'm doing is I'm going to feed this wire through and I want to create a bigger loop to get around the top of this loop here. So you can see I need a few more seed beads. Get some more. I'm going to grab a few more. Now I have a dream. I'll tell you my little secret dream is um, and if you like Pinterest, they, you can see this, this style all over Pinterest, which is kind of a beaded curtain, and they have it hanging in the window. Oh, that's perfect. See how that's coming up around? I want to make sure I just catch that. Yeah, that looks good. So this way I have this beaded loop uh, around um, through the hole and around. So once I thread it back through the crimp, that'll be a decorative loop. And I'm going to show you something real quick. I'm going to take it out of the air, hopefully without dropping all the seed beads. And I'm just going to do that again without my pendant in there. And I just want to show you. I showed you that you can use a button for a clasp. And if you make a beaded loop on one side of your piece, you can and fit it to whatever button you're going to use, you can use a beaded loop and a button as your clasp for any of your strung pieces. So, um, so you can use these beaded loops not only to connect something like this, but you can also use it as the clasp itself. So that could be the, the loop on one side of a button, uh, a button clasp on the other. So hopefully that's helpful, and I'm going to thread that back through my donut-shaped thing. And here we go, same steps. Take the end, jump over everything that's hanging from it. This could be your clasp, it could be whatever you're doing. We're doing that donut and all those seed beads, and I'm going to thread that back through. And the heavier um, piece that you're working with when you get to crimping, you really want to give yourself kind of a mighty tail so that it just doesn't slip out. And I'm going to fiddle my fingers around, that looks good. And I'm going to again put my crimp in the dip. Oops. And I'm using my, I'm tugging. You can see I'm holding this because this piece, let me make sure that that's, I think that'll be okay. I was thinking maybe I should add another seed bead, but I think we'll go for it. I'm tugging on these two pieces of wire so that I can make sure my crimp is nice and close to the beads. I'm going to squish it. And there's my loop. And if I want to, probably, I will just do that fold again. Again, see, I'm coming perpendicular to the crimp. I'm just going to fold it in half. Hopefully I got it. There. Yeah. So there's another base for my, for my sun catcher. <laughs> my dog is having a fit. It's funny, he's not much of a barker, but he's, he's barking. Okay, so here I go. I am going to 
Since our word of the week is whimsy, I'm going to bring that in here to just kind of inspire us, keep the inspiration going. I am just going to, I'm going to um, put our jump ring that we're going to use at the top end over there. Um, I just have a mix of what I call bead soup. So I've got all these different beads. These are just from bags that I've had. Um, and I'm just going to do something very random. So again, I, I talked about it at the beginning. I've got another little dish over here of beads. When you don't know what to do, um, oftentimes what happens is that um, it's hard to get out of this idea of should, like, oh my gosh, I have to do it this way, or um, you get this preconceived notion, I'm just starting. You can just see, I'm just going to start beading. I'm not even really going to pay attention. I'm going to put, um, do I want to do that? I think maybe I'll do a, a bead that has a little bit smaller hole because I can tell that this hole is going to rub against um, that. So I don't, I'm going to just choose this one. And I'm going to start by saying, when I put my first bead, doesn't matter whether this is my crystal or my clasp or whatever it is on the end, the you can see that I have my long wire that I'm working with. And then I have this tail, the tail that we, thre we um, threaded through the crimp. You want to make sure your first bead or beads goes over both wires. And I'm gonna just do that on both. Uh, I'm just gonna put two beads here. And you need to have at least one bead. And the reason being is that when, if this were a, a necklace and this were a clasp, and this is going to be at the back of my neck, if I trim that tail off right at the crimp here, Remember I was talking about how many strands are in that stringing wire, those strands of steel? If you trim this short little piece of wire right at the crimp, you will always have seven little strands or 49 strands or 19 strands, however many strands of steel you have, poking out from the end of that crimp. And, one, and it's really, really hard uh, to get rid of it if you trim it here. So the easiest way to do it is to make sure your first couple beads go over that tail and then use your cutter. Take the back of your cutter here, back in. So um, you can see that my cutter has like what I call a cleft on the, on the front. So it's got that big V shape and then it has a flat back. I always go in with the back toward my piece and then I nip it off. And usually what I do is I cover it, but um, my hands, both my hands are busy right here. Really well. And also what happens is that as, if this were a piece, as I wear it, gravity will just pull that down just over the cut end and you won't feel it. So, um, so that's just my, what I do. And I'm going to keep going. I'm just going to add some beads. I'm not looking anymore. I'm just plunking them on. My tail, I trimmed my tail. I'm just going to go. And this uh, mix here, I'm calling bead soup. So if you have trouble with random uh, pieces, I would say just go for it. Just put a dish down and pick it up. I, I had to really teach myself um, or give myself opportunity to do random uh, pieces because I, I really wasn't used to doing it. Um, I, one, actually, um, when I, in my priestess circle, one of our divine feminine archetypes was the muse and the muse's whole world is about whimsy and so when we were learning about the muse i gave myself a task well when for every archetype that we studied i created a piece uh, based around that archetype's energy and quality and stones and things like that so when it got to the muse i decided that i was going to create a random piece. It was very hard for me because I am um, I'm I'm very linear in my own way. So uh, so that was my my um, experiment was to create a random piece. Uh, so I did that, and so that was when we were studying the muse. So that's perfect for our week of whimsy today. So I'm going to just keep going, and uh, I'm just going to add whatever I want. I might want to add this big green one. These are again what I call bead soup. Maybe I would have liked to do that on the bottom, but I'm not even gonna. I'm not even. See, this is what I do. I'm like, I wish I had put that on the bottom, but oh well. Here I go. So I've got more. I'm just gonna dump all those in there, 
and I'm going to keep going. So I was saying um, I have this wish uh, for making a beaded window curtain, or at least multiple ones of these sun catchers, all random, they don't have to match, and just have them hanging in my window in my living room um, and have the, the light coming through them. So I'm, uh, this is the start. And if you uh, watch this again, you can make one and uh, have one for yourself. I keep going. I think there's a hole there. Yeah. And I'm just going to keep going, going. I'm just going to uh, finish this up because I want to show you how to finish it. Make sure I'm still on camera because I'm getting very involved. <laughs> And let's see what I've got. That's over a foot long. It's getting there. I'm going to just do a few more beads, maybe a nice long one to get me to grow a little bit more here. And I'm going to keep it out of the way. Do some small ones. So I'm not even paying attention really to what I'm getting anymore. I'm just grabbing. So again, this is a really good exercise. When you feel stuck and you don't know what you're doing, what you, what you want to even make, Give yourself an exercise of doing something completely freeform. It'll it'll loosen you up, for sure. Okay, a couple more, and I just want to get to the end. I'm going to do a nice long one, and maybe one of these. Maybe that one. I think I'm done. Let's see how long I am. I think I'm over a good. Definitely over a foot. Maybe getting close on two feet. So I think I'm going to stop there, and I want to show you how to finish. So I know all of you have the endings of your projects that you have. You might have five beads from this project, 20 beads from this project, and then what do you do? Because you already made a project with all those beads. This um, sun catcher project is a really perfect way to use up your bead soup. I mean, there's so many different bead soup projects, but this is a really fun one to do. And also, uh, with this is a great gift. I have some hanging in my house that I've had for over 20, 20, 30 years that people gave me. Um, one I was looking at today that had a broken um, leaf, like a brass leaf like this hanging. That's what reminded me to show you this. Um, and I just treasure them because they're completely unique and they'd be a great gift. So um, you can use all your bead soups, uh, beads for making these. Okay, so I'm going to show you uh, what I'm going to do next. I'm going to get these guys out of the way, push them over. I can't wait to make one with this guy. Oh, I can't wait. And I'm going to start with my solder jump ring. So this is um, a twisted solder jump ring, meaning that it's not open. So my wire, uh, if I put this wire, thread this wire through an open jump ring, I, no matter how close you try to get the jump ring uh, to close, if you put stringing wire on an open jump ring, I guarantee the stringing wire and the opening will magically align at some point and your jump ring will fall off. So you always want to crimp onto something closed, something secure or soldered. So I am going to again get my crimp. And I'm going to thread it onto my wire drop that down make sure that my the whole of my bead actually you can see the whole of my bead I don't know if you can see that is bigger than the crimp so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to borrow one of these seed beads that has a smaller hole so that my crimp doesn't fall down into the middle of that bead and I'm gonna thread my crimp back on there I am so now I know that crimp is gonna stay put where I want it so I am going to take this wire and I'm going to create a loop that wraps around my jump ring. And since I don't really want to have my wire exposed, I am going to use my seed beads. And I could, um, one of the reasons I'm making a beaded loop, I call these beaded loops, is not only because it's decorative, but also this little seed bead loop is going to protect my wire from wearing against that metal jump ring. So it adds a little bit of extra protection, gives the wire a little bit more life. Um, and it's more decorative. Here I go. I think that's probably good. I'm going to come back through, thread that through my jump ring, and I'm going to jump over all of that. So all of that's just hanging there.
thread it back through my crimp and through a few beads. So on the other end of your necklace, once you go through the crimp, just automatically go through a few beads. It's easier than going through the crimp and then trying to stuff the wire once you tighten it down. And then I'm just going to pull. Now this is where, especially when you're making a necklace, um, what will happen, especially when you're starting, when you're beginning, is that sometimes you end up with this gap. You think you've tightened everything up, and then all of a sudden, after you've crimped it, you have this gap in your piece. So I like to spend a little bit of time talking about that. And especially since we have all these really heavy beads, these beads are going to be pulling the wire away in this direction. So I'm going to, um, I don't like to have, um, to jam the beads down. What I like to do is hold it up, and I'm sorry this is out of camera range, but I let um, gravity stack the beads for me. And then you can see I've got this little gap here. So I'm going to pull down on the beads, pull down on the crimp, pull the wire. And then I'm going to check it again. I'm going to hold it back up. And there you can see this. the beads are so heavy they keep pulling it away. So I'm going to do that again. I'm going to pull down on the beads, pull down on the crimp, and then pull the wire. And if you don't pull down on the crimp, everything's going to stay right where it was because the crimp is kind of holding everything in place. I'm going to do that again. I'm going to stack the beads, see if I have any more. Looks like, like I did a pretty good job. You don't want to over tighten because what will happen, especially with, I'm going to hold that kind of tight, because with quirky shaped beads like this, if you over tighten, they'll just not lay right. So again, what I do at the end is I kind of jiggle them all, give them a little jiggle, wiggle and jiggle, I call it, and then make sure everything looks pretty good. And get that out of the way. I think I feel pretty good about that. And again, when you're working with heavier beads, it can be tough. So now this is the ch most challenging part, and I'm going to show you. You can see right where my crimp is, I have a bead here, and I've got these two beads coming down. So where my crimper has to fit is kind of small. So what I like to do is kind of open that up a little bit more. get my crimp in place where I need it. My crimper is now, the crimp is sitting in the dip and I know it's really hard to see because I've got all this stuff going on, but I'm making sure my crimp is right in that dip. And so when you're crimping, especially seed beads, if you're creating these beaded loops, you want to make sure that even a tiny part of the seed bead is not in between the jaws because once you start squeezing, it'll crack, it'll break the crimp. Um, it'll break the seed bead. And the other thing too, the, the other side of doing that is that if you get a seed bead on a piece that you don't want and you don't want to take all, say I put a seed bead way down here and I don't want to take all those beads off, just get your crimper on there, crack it, crimp it, crimp your seed bead that you don't want gently, it'll crack off and then you can uh, tighten everything up. So here we go. So I'm just, once I get my crimper in there, I'm just going to make sure my crimp is sitting in the dip. Now I can give it a little extra tug because this part of the crimp, crimper, is wider than my crimp. So even if I over tighten, once I, I take my tool out, there'll be a little bit of extra space. So that'll be okay. I'm gonna pull and tighten, squeeze. Nobody cracked, which is good. And if I wanna just leave it as is, I can, or I can um, fold it if I would like to do that. Get my cutter. I'm going to get my cutter in there. Again, I'm going to go in with the back of my cutter close. Try and make sure that I'm not nipping my main wire. And oops, let me get him in there. Give him a nip. And once I wiggle and jiggle around everything, I think everybody is pretty good. There's a little bit, a tiny bit of space, but even that tiny bit of space is just enough for uh, for some some movement. I love this cutter. Uh, this is um, a German-made cutter. It's by Euro Tool. They are who um, manufactures my tools, um, and I love this. I love this cutter. I'm wondering if I can show you the Italian cutter as well. Let me grab that real quick. Okay, so this is the Italian cutter. You can see um, this is again by Euro Tool. 
and this is the German cutter. Now, some people love the fineness of this German cutter. It's a little bit smaller tool. Uh, some people really like the grips and the heaviness of this. Um, what people ask me what the difference is, really it's what your hand likes. They're both hardened for steel, so they will both cut, um, they're made to cut uh, steel and stringing wire, so um, whichever one you prefer. They're both flush, these are called extra flush cutters, and they're both hardened for steel. So um, this is an Italian cutter, this is a German cutter. And they're both in my, um, they're on my Omtara uh, web shop and they're, they're excellent. I couldn't decide which one I liked better, so I carry them both. And when I do sell my toolkits in person at shows, I give people the choice. Do you want the yellow, or do you want the German or the Italian? Whichever one. You can see they're definitely different sizes. So, love those cutters. Um, so that's our little quickie project. We'll, so we covered um, how to add, how to crimp onto something. For today it was our crystal. And this could be your, it's the same technique to crimp onto a clasp. So we made our, uh, our, we put on our crimp, we threaded the wire through our end piece, and we threaded it back through the crimp and secured it with the crimping pliers. Then we did, added our first two beads, trimmed off the tail, and then kept going. Beading, beading, we did a random pattern, kept going, got up to the end, and I checked this, the hole of this bead, and it was a little too big because my crimp would have fallen in, so I put a seed bead there. And then I added my crimp. I created a beaded loop so that I could have a decorative loop going around my jump ring. Threaded the wire back through the crimp, back through a couple beads, tightened, pulled down on the beads, pulled down on the crimp, tightened, did that a couple times, let gravity stack the beads, and then I gently placed my crimper right into the space between, where is my crimp, there it is, um, so I could secure it with the crimper. And then we also covered how to use a donut shaped bead and create a beaded loop for that. There's our crimp at the bottom, there's our little tail that we're going to cover up with a couple beads. And then we also made a tiny little triangle with just three beads uh, as a stopper for a larger hold. Uh, this is a gemstone bead as a base. So this could be, we could use any any piece as a base. So I hope you like that. Oh, if the last bead has a small hole, would you change the beads so that the wire can run through it two times? Ah, oh, yes. So the very last bead, this is a great question. This bead right here has to be able to, and, and I put, this, this is my very last bead. I, I finished my piece. I've got my crimp on, I'm, I'm adding my clasp, or I'm adding whatever my, my end is going to be, and I'm bringing my wire back through the crimp, and what I just did is I, I thread that wire back right through these last two beads. These beads, whatever is at the end, the beginning and end of your, your piece, especially a necklace, these beads have to be able to accommodate two wires. So sometimes you're gonna be making a pearl necklace and of the wire you choose fits on the pearls perfectly. When you add your crimp and you bring the wire back through, it does not fit through that last crimp, that last pearl, because the pearl hole is too small. So yes, this very last bead next to the crimp um, needs to be able to accommodate two wires. And so sometimes what you have to do is in your design, the very last bead could be a, cl um, a crystal or something that can accommodate two wires. You just have to make sure. Otherwise, if you're selling your jewelry or you're giving it as a gift or you want to wear it, if you trim the wire right at the crimp, you will get that pokey stub of wire. It's and really worth changing your design so you have a wire here, I mean a bead here that can accommodate both wires. So that's a really, really great question. You might end up having a signature uh, the way you finish your piece is a signature finish, and um, that and it's functional so that you can put two wires in, but it also becomes something very unique to the way you make your pieces. So that's that's a great idea. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, pop them in the comments. And Tuesday, I'm going to do uh, that's going to be what I call our office hours or our tip day. So any questions you might have, pop them in and I'll answer it. On Tuesday, I am going to show how to use the ends of leather or cord to make um, earrings, because that came up, so I'll, I'll do that. So, and that's Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. 
And then again, next Thursday, we'll do another stringing project. And I'm so excited to have you here. So thank you. I'm going to turn around so I can um, say goodbye to you in person. Flip you up again. Yay, there you are. So I hope you really liked that. I hope even if you are an experienced beater, you, um, you learn something. If you're beginning, welcome. Uh, beating is just, just the, the most wonderful uh, hobby. Uh, it's also a, a business venture with great potential. So even if you're starting out, um, I've had people start beating and then start their own businesses. So it's, it's great, whatever end of the spectrum you want to be on or anywhere in the middle. So thanks again. I'm so glad you guys had fun and I'm really happy to see you. I'll see you Tuesday morning. And again, we'll be back here for some more stringing uh, on Thursday at three. So thank you. Take care and pop any questions you might have in the in the um, comments. Oh, and I also wanted to tell you, um, I have a cheat sheet. So for those of you that are beginning, I have what I call the beaters cheat sheet. They were uh, some of the forms that I handed out to my college class at the beginning. So there's a, a checklist of all the basics that you want to have on hand if you want, I call it your bead stash. So I have that. I have a project, uh, kind of an organizer. There's um, some narrative stuff in there and there's also resources, uh, online resources of where you can buy some of my favorite places. So it's called the Cheat Sheets. And if you go on my Om Tara website, uh, at the top of the, all of the top parts of my website say, it's a photograph and it says, join my tribe. So if you click on that and you, give me your email address basically, you will get the cheat sheet sent to you so that it automatically sends it to you. And I think there's also a coupon uh, for a certain amount off in my store. So um, if you want the cheat sheets, if you're starting out, it's there. It's just a great um, basic information about starting beading. So um, thanks again and I will see you next week. Have a great weekend and happy beading. Take care. Bye.